Okay. Um, I was inspired uh, to speak this morning on a uh, topic that we haven't heard too much of here, uh, in part by uh, a comment that Seth made in his remarks on Friday night in which he explained that for him it's, this whole adventure has been really a, a love story, um, coming to understand about the potential of biology uh, t to help us out of this, this terrible dilemma that we're in right now or seem to be in. And um, as I came to my version of the love story with this material, or sometimes I joke, you know, drinking the soil carbon Kool-Aid, um, <laughs> once, once you get into it, there's no going back. Um, I began to see that, uh, or one of the issues that I had in, um, was when I first bumped up this, into this material was actually the, the term holism. I was trained as a chemist, and as a scientist, I was skeptical of words such as this. It, it certainly didn't appear in any of my classic science education, unfortunately. Um, and in my mind, I, I had come to associate it with um, sort of a, a new agey mysticism, maybe pseudoscience, um, you know, things that I had difficulty understanding if there was any basis for and so on. But um, I was surprised as I came to the work of Alan Savory and began to appreciate his relationship of, of systems working together in, nat in nature. Um, he explains early uh, in his book, um, uh, Holistic Management, a, a Framework for Decision Making, um, he explains that the term holism is actually a, a, a very old term. It dates back to Jan Smuts, who was a, a South African statesman and politician and, and a military leader, um, as was Alan Savory himself, I might add. Um, 1926, his book, Holism and Evolution, he wrote, the tendency of, in nature to form holes that are greater than the sum of the parts through creative evolution. Now, he wasn't alone in expressing views simil similar to this, although he did coin the word holism, which is taken from the word whole with a W on it, the word whole, holism. Um, Walt Whitman, actually, uh, was written about by Jan Smuts uh, as a young man, still a student at, at Cambridge. Um, and Jan Smuts was deeply moved uh, by the poetry of, of Walt Whitman. And, um, and of course, John Muir expressed a similar thought in other ways. When we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. The great naturalist. And of course, the book Leaves of Grass. Um, now, in its day, the theory of holism had some very popular supporters. In fact, Albert Einstein commented that he thought that the two theories that would guide us most in the next thousand years uh, would be his own theory of relativity and Jan Smuts's theory of holism. So, um, learning this and understanding the, the historical antecedents for it has given me a really a fresh appreciation of the word holism, and it's one that I use now um, proudly in describing this work that is so important in bringing things together. Um, William Blake wrote these lines that many of you may be familiar with. They're ones that I learned from a, a hippie school teacher when I was in fifth grade. Um, and as I think about it now in terms of what I've learned through holistic management and through the entire world of ecological restoration, this poem has taken on significantly a new meaning for me. Um, each line, to see a world in a grain of sand, I think now of the deserts you know, in, in the world. Imagine the worlds that, that can be brought back from them. Um, of course, heaven in a wild flower, we know now that the biodiversity of all wild flowers and all of wildlife is essential. Um, holding infinity in the palm of our hands. I think about this line, I, I think about all the climate reports and graphs and data that I read literally on you know, my iPhone in the palm of my hand. And essentially, it's infinity. The entire history of the planet, the carbon dioxide history going back millions of years, you know, in the palm of my hand. And then eternity in an hour. This is our hour, it's the hour of action. Eternity, as far as we can see anyway, for human generations, depends on the choices that are being made um, by us and, um, and by the people we reach and, and by the people that we influence and, and by all the carbon that we get back into the ground. So. Um, that concludes uh, the formal part of my remark. I'd like to end um, briefly with a, a poem that I wrote. This was written a number of years ago when the ozone crisis was still quite severe and the Montreal Protocol had not been signed yet. And I'd like to um, just mention those of you who saw Bill Muma 
speak on Friday night may not know, but early in his career, uh, he was very concerned and worked on as a legislative aide um, in Congress uh, on, on policies that later became uh, the underpinning of the, the Montreal Protocol. Um, so thanks in part to him, uh, the ozone crisis uh, seems to have been solved. My poem is called Lament of a Green. The skin on my back should be brown, but it's red. This summer's tan is a burn instead. As UV levels climb through the roof, industry heads remain aloof. Less ozone fills the southern, hemis the southern hemisphere, but what is that for us to fear? Traditionally, the South gets trashed for short-term gain in a big wad of cash. It's downright American to lend a helping hand while wreaking eco-havoc upon a foreign land. But foreign is passe. We're all next door. Our third world sins now pound against our shore. Imperial flags are yet unfurled. Red the blood of species no longer of this world. White the fear of having tipped nature's scale too far. Blue once the color of oceans, now covered with oil and tar. How far will things degenerate before we stop and see? There is a way to live with nature in peaceful harmony, to use the fruits of our knowledge and might to nourish and sustain and not for fear and blight. Thank you. Um, joining us uh, first will be Jim Laurie, uh, my friend, a restoration ecologist who uh, trained with John Todd of the New Alchemy Institute. And, um, I welcome Jim up to the lectern.